Hey guys, it's Godbars here, the self-proclaimed hip-hop historian, and this is the 36th episode of my series where I grab a vinyl from my collection, talk about why I love it, what influence it had, and what its place is in the grand scheme of hip-hop. So as I mentioned in the last video, I'm now moving on to classic 90s albums, which I'm going to tackle in a group of 20. The reason for such a high number will become apparent the further along I get in the set, because I strongly feel that every single one I picked is essential listening for aspiring hip-hop heads. Obviously, I'm not saying you can't possibly enjoy or appreciate these albums by newer artists without having heard the albums that inspired them, I'm just saying it adds an extra layer. I do kind of feel like if you're a fan of somebody like Kendrick Lamar or Joey Badass, it's a bit counterintuitive to ignore or dismiss the myriad of game-changing albums that inspired them. If it just isn't your taste, that's one thing, but you really can't separate them entirely and pretend that just because 90s hip-hop is old that it's irrelevant or not worth knowing about. It's clear that those popular, contemporary, lyrical rappers I just named don't think that, and it isn't just because they say they respect these OGs in interviews. If you know albums like Illmatic, you'll catch constant references in modern hip-hop virtually anywhere you look. Even in reverse, if you haven't listened to Illmatic, but have heard a lot of 2010's classics, if you check it out, you'll find plenty of material you recognize through all the times it's been sampled, referenced, or reworked. I mean, I do my best to give a breakdown of these genre-defining projects for the people who've maybe always heard the album titles in conversation or seen the covers, but never really thought too far into them or understood the hype. I think the mindset you go into these albums with can play a big part in your enjoyment, especially with an LP like Illmatic, where it's pretty routinely called the best album in the genre. That was even my experience initially, because when I was in middle school and only knew a handful of select songs from the 90s, I went into Illmatic expecting it to blow me away and be the most instantly gratifying experience in music. It may have just been a personal issue, but that was something I struggled with in general when I was 12 or 13, first attempting to listen to albums as a whole experience. With all sorts of genres, I would hear about some revolutionary classic and expect it to click right away, but now I've learned a lot of my favorite albums have moments that I initially didn't love and found myself just sitting through for the principle. But a good amount of the time, those are the songs that end up growing on me the most, and the catchy ones that were easy to digest become less enjoyable over dozens of listens. With Illmatic, I think it's important to not go into it comparing it to modern rap, or even something as recent as the first Lupe Fiasco album. Because just like with cinema or TV shows, a younger person may watch The Exorcist and have no idea why it's considered the scariest movie ever. They might say the little girl being possessed is a boring, overdone trope, but the thing is it wasn't one when the movie came out. You can't compare it to all the things that it influenced, you have to compare it to what people had to go off at that time. Just like a kid today may be desensitized to a possessed little girl in a horror movie, a younger hip-hop listener may feel that the rhyme schemes and drum patterns on Illmatic have been done a million times. But like The Exorcist, the reason you've seen or heard those attributes and so much other work is due to how influential and game-changing the piece of art was. Now obviously there were a myriad of classics prior to Illmatic's release in 94, and hip-hop was actually in an amazing place the year before in 1993. Just some of the groundbreaking material to come up that year includes 36 Chambers, Midnight Marauders, 93 Till Infinity, Doggy Style, It's On Dr. Dre, 187 Um Killa, Lethal Injection, Return of the Boom Bap, Balloon Mind State, Enter the Stage, Here Come the Lords, Inner City Griots, 21 and Over, The First Jazzmatazz, and Strictly for My N- I know that's a lot of albums, but that's only the ones from that year I have on vinyl, so I wanted to emphasize that Elmatic didn't just casually slip into its position because there wasn't anything interesting or dope going on at the time. What's important to understand is that Elmatic quite literally changed how everyone in the game wrote and executed their lines, similar to Rakim before him. 
He made virtually every MC at the time shake in their boots because even the influential legends I named earlier were forced to take it to the next level to keep up. This fear of being left in the dust and falling behind their contemporaries pushed them all to be better MCs and artists in general. Nas had faster flows than most of the rappers at the time, and the lyrics were witty and intelligent while still talking about real-life street situations. Even from his appearance on Main Source's 1991 album Breaking Adams, he was already spitting the type of dense rhymes and intricate schemes he would later be known for. Not only was Nas the complete package where street dudes and nerdy kids both had something to appreciate, but even the fashion style he was coining at the time became the type of thing you'll see practically every boom bap rapper after him in the 90s wear. He was a key figure in helping hip-hop transition from the flashy outfits of the 80s to something more relatable and attainable to the average kid in the ghetto. He also tells the story of this album as if he's witnessing all these events from his window and writing down what he saw over the years. It's another one of those things that doesn't seem uncommon now, but at the time the idea of telling a story from the narrator's point of view and removing yourself completely was fresh and exciting. This was highlighted not just by the skits, but by the dusty feel of the production. But of course it isn't like Nas just put out this one album that changed hip-hop and then sat back and waited for everyone to catch up to him. He kept practicing and advancing as an MC and songwriter, so much so that his following album, It Was Written, has gained a status amongst many Nas fans as his best album, even over Illmatic. I don't think anyone would ever get mad at that take because I find it unlikely that many people who love Illmatic don't love It Was Written, being it features pretty much every quality the debut had, but slightly updated. The reason Illmatic has traditionally gotten the nod as the best Nas album is due to its immeasurable influence. I feel like he upped the bar with his debut, then after all the top rappers responded and tried operating on that level, he came back with another classic to show he wasn't a one-album wonder who was just gonna leave that throne vacant. He also was showing that he wasn't going to just sit around and wait for everyone else to catch up. Instead, he practiced and got better at the same time they did, and that technique kept him two steps ahead of most of the game throughout the 90s, and he would start fleshing out the more conceptual and poetic writing style he would specialize in down the line. But while there's amazing beats all over it was written, one of the things that made Illmatic so huge at the time was the super group of producers and DJs Nas recruited. The beats are practically all instantly recognizable and highly regarded, and they were divided between legends like DJ Premier, Pete Rock, Large Professor, Q-Tip, and L.E.S. Since Elmatic isn't that long of an experience compared to some other albums, the features here are pretty few and far between. These are all fitting contributions though. On top of the beat he made, Q-Tip lends his vocals for One Love, and there's also appearances from AZ and Olu Dara, who's actually Nas's father. Overall, while it's hard to find much to say about this album that hasn't been said already, it's still insanely enjoyable to me, and I think it's an important LP for hip-hop fans of any age to hear at least one. My favorite songs off this list topping classic would be NY State of Mind, Life's a Bitch, and The World is Yours. But of course, I have to shout out a couple other favorites like Halftime, Memory Lane, and Represent. Thank you for watching my 36th video. As I mentioned at the beginning, I'm going to be continuing on with insanely well known albums from the 90s. The type of albums you'll almost always see at the top of a best hip hop albums of all time list. Anyway, be sure to tune in next time to see what legendary rapper I talk about, and don't forget to like, subscribe, and let me know what your favorite songs off of Nas's masterpiece of a debut are. Don't forget to have a great day, and I'll see you next time, okay? Alright.